Good morning, everyone. Welcome. If you are new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. Before we begin today, I just want to apologize to all of you who have a sense of smell. Maybe you noticed something this morning. A while back, I told everyone that I am not allowed to do any grocery shopping. Why? Because I'll end up with a whole cart full of Captain Crunch, Fruity Pebbles, things like that. Dinosaur, Chef Boyardee, pasta, delicious things the five-year-old in me loves. This week, I was allowed to go shopping for the air fresheners here at the church. Normally, the girls get things like rose petal air fresheners, ocean mist, nothing manly. This week, I saw a couple of new ones, wet paint and burning tires. I decided to go with that, and that's what we put in the system this week, so blame me. We got a new roof, that's what happened. So you're smelling some of the sealant or something like that. It has dissipated quite a bit this week and I expect it won't affect anything next week. I'm quite used to it or um, it's having an effect on my brain. So we'll see what happens this morning. Clearly that's the case, that's what I'm gonna blame it on. That's my story, I'm sticking to it. I'm excited to be in, I believe, the ninth part of our Jesus League series this morning. This is where we are looking at the New Testament authors of the Bible. We started this series with the Gospels, the four Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in that order. When we looked at Luke, we looked at Acts, because Acts is a history of the early church written by Luke. We looked at Paul and his 13 letters to different churches and different people. Two of those people are Titus and Timothy, or were Titus and Timothy. They were not primary authors of the New Testament portion of the Bible. They didn't write any books of the Bible, but we included them because they were an important part of the Jesus League that we're talking about. Last week, we talked about James and the sin of partiality. This week, we are in Peter. But before we begin, I want to make something really clear to all of you. I realized that as we were going through this series, if you know your Bible, if you've been a Christian for a while, it's understood and implied that God wrote the Bible ultimately. It was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you've been here for a while. I just took it for granted that, of course, everybody knows that. But I figured maybe some people don't know that. They are writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is God. So when we say that these people are authors, we mean that they're the vehicles. Because when God uses us, he doesn't strip us of our personalities. We saw that in Luke. The purpose of looking at the Greek in Luke, and that it was really complicated, was to show you all that he was writing to a specific audience, right? The aristocracy. He's writing to wealthier people, educated people. Whereas Mark's gospel account was very simple. So that could answer the question, why do we have four Gospels? There are a lot of reasons for that we're not going to get into this morning, but that is clearly one. All right, so we're used, when God uses us as vehicles of his gospel, of his love, he doesn't strip us of our personalities. Some people may like the way I preach. Some people may like the way someone else preaches. All right, so that's what's going on here. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So who was Peter? Peter is seen as the lead apostle. He was probably the oldest of all the apostles. Uh, we see this in the writings. The text kind of makes it clear here and there, but the most popular place is the temple tax in Matthew 17. It's only Peter and Jesus who have to pay that. We know historically that people under the age of 20 didn't have to pay that tax. So you can envision the other disciples as teenage boys. I kind of made that joke one time. I believe I was in John or something like that about them being kind of silly. But Peter is older. Maybe that's why he's the lead apostle or seen that way. He goes by three names, Simon or Simeon, and then Peter and Cephas. Both Peter and Cephas mean rock in different languages, Greek and Aramaic, respectively. And no, it is not the way you pronounce those names in Greek or Aramaic. I'm not even going to try. We went over that too. Some denominations see him as the rock on which the church is built. That comes mainly from passages like Matthew 16, starting at verse 15, Jesus said, and what about you? <clears throat> Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus replied, Happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my Father who is in heaven has shown you. I tell you that you are Peter, and I'll build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld, or hell, or Hades, won't be able to stand against it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Anything you fasten on earth will be fastened in heaven. Anything you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. He was part of the inner circle of disciples. We saw that when we looked at John. It's quite often that Peter, James, and John are included to go to special places with Jesus. It happens a lot. One such case here, just to point one out, <clears throat> Jesus is going to bring uh, the synagogue official's daughter to life, raise her from the dead. It says Mark 5, 37, he didn't allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, James' brother. He was chosen first out of all the apostles. And whenever you see a list of the apostles, Peter is always listed first. What did Peter write? First and second Peter. Also, many scholars believe that Mark is based largely on Peter's teaching. Written in Rome, a.k.a. Babylon. Babylon is often code word in the New Testament for Rome. There are parallels that he draws from, from the Old Testament, that he applies to Gentiles in their suffering as the Israelites were suffering in exile when they were dispersed. That's why he used the terms aliens. It means two things. It means that they're really not of this world and also that, like the Israelites, they're dispersed in a similar way. It was penned by Silvanus or Silas, First Peter anyway. So a lot of these writers, I think I've mentioned this to you, they use a scribe or someone to write it out. Maybe he had better Greek. But a little trivia, Silas appears in other places, or Silvanus, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. So he appears as kind of a co-author. People do that quite often. 1st Peter 5.12. I've written and sent these few lines to you by Silvanus. I consider him to be a faithful brother. In these lines, I have urged and affirmed that this is the genuine grace of God. Stand firm in it. So he is a faithful dude. Uh, he hangs out with Paul in prison. In Acts 16, we see he gets beaten by rods and they worship in prison, so much so that it literally rocks the house. So check out Acts 15, 16, and 17 when you get a chance. There are themes in this text. We see that Peter's letters, they're going to be really good in this part of the series because they bring together a lot of the themes that we're seeing in other letters that we've looked at in previous books of the New Testament. Peter is writing to persecuted Christians. The idea here is that life's hardships deepen or purify our faith as gold is purified by fire. 1 Peter 1, starting at verse 7, or verse 7. This is necessary so that your faith may be found genuine. Your faith is more valuable than gold, which will be destroyed, even though it itself is tested by fire. Your genuine faith will result in praise, glory, and honor for you when Jesus Christ is revealed. And we'll, say, we'll see that he's alluding to something there with the fire. It's not necessarily great. Like Titus, men to authorities, wives and slaves to husbands and their masters, submit as Christ submitted for the sake of the gospel. We'll put the parallel up. Titus 3.1 Remind Christians to submit to rulers and authorities. They should be obedient and ready to do every good thing. They shouldn't speak disrespectfully about who? Someone? Anyone. But they should be peaceful, kind, and show complete courtesy toward everyone. 1 Peter 2.13, for the sake of the Lord, submit to every human institution. Do this, whether it means submitting to the emperor as supreme ruler, we'll get into that in a minute, or to governors as those sent by the emperor. They are sent to punish those doing evil and to praise those doing good. Submit to them because it's God's will that by doing good, you will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. <laughs> Do this as God's slaves, yet also as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Honor everyone Love the family of believers, have respectful fear of God, honor the emperor. So we see here the good deeds that we also saw in Titus. 
They were to attract non-believers, right? So uh, I believe we were talking in James, was it, when we looked at Peter? Anyway, you'd have wives who maybe had an unbelieving husband. And so the idea here was to behave so well, have such good deeds, treat him so respectfully that maybe they get attracted to the faith, right? Who are these Christians? The emperor that he's talking about there is most likely Nero. And if you know your history, it was really, really bad. He was lighting Christians on fire for fun. So that purified by fire thing definitely alludes to something. Yet, honor him. They were long-sighted. They were doing things for the sake of the gospel. <clears throat> to be a good witness, 1 Peter 2. Verse 11, dear friends, since you are immigrants and strangers in the world, so you get that some version will say like aliens, which confuses modern readers, but this is ultimately not our home. Heaven is. I urge you, avoid worldly desires that wage war against your lives. Live honorably among the unbelievers. Today they defame you as if you were doing evil, but in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him because they have observed your honorable deeds. So remember that. We talked about not slandering the gospel with bad actions. We looked at the historian Josephus last week. He's really important to Christian apologists because he backs up a lot of the stuff that's in our Bibles. So if we're looking for non-biblical stuff to back it up to secular people, we believe, but don't take that for granted. What about a non-believer? They're going to say, well... Where else do we find this? Josephus is one of those people. Tacitus as well, also Pliny the Younger. He was Roman governor around 111 AD. So just, what, 80 years or so after the crucifixion of Christ, kind of in a witness period, very close to the events. He's writing to the emperor Trajan, and he's describing these torture tactics that he's using. So we're going to put the text up. It's a really dicey translation, so bear with me. I may paraphrase it. So anyway, he's just telling him what, telling the emperor what he's doing in these interactions. He says, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, so that's like a bad thing, they're persecuting the Christians, I have observed the following procedure. This is how he does it. I interrogated these Christians as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, they said they're Christians, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, they didn't denounce Christ, he executed them. Then, here's what he does. He goes and gets all kinds of things like idols, incense, the, an, an, emperor, uh, an image of the emperor, <clears throat> and he makes them essentially worship them. He forces to worship them. He gives them the lines to say and everything. And if they worship, he lets them off the hook. But here's what he says, which is interesting. None of which those who are really Christians, weird sentence, it is said, can be forced to do these. So what he's saying is, the people who were really Christians, he could not compel them, he could not force them to worship the idols or the image of the emperor. They would just gladly die. So this is what's going on in the early church. So you have different stages of persecution. We see it in Acts, right? So you have, they're going into the synagogue first. I described to you guys that they're all Jewish believers first for a long period of time. And so they go into the synagogues. This is Paul's tradition. He goes into the synagogue every, every time he enters a city, tries to convince them they worship there because they're Jewish believers. Okay? So like Messianic Jews. They, they're Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Then they start getting chased out of the synagogues and beaten there and in trouble there. And so they start doing church outside the synagogues in home churches. And they can't build churches yet because eventually there's Roman persecution. It starts up, and by the time we get to Nero, it gets crazy. Really, really crazy. So some of these letters are to encourage the believers, like Thessalonians, that may be Jewish persecution. But Peter, this is Roman persecution, and it's very, very serious. So they have to be encouraged. And just as a side note to you guys, we're lucky here. You know, we complain a lot. Like someone threatens to like, I don't even know what, you know, what well, we can't say prayer in schools. It's like, 
You're not being lit on fire. And if you don't think that this isn't happening in other countries, look it up. You won't hear anybody signing up for mission trips to like Iran or Iraq or anything like that. I made a joke about that. So go there and start talking about Jesus. Ladies, go there and dress the way you're dressed today. See what happens. So it is happening to our brothers and sisters in other places in the world. So when we complain about our politicians or all these little things, easy. Try to remember what's going on in other places and what's really important. The gospel. Jesus is what is important. So all of this is as a witness to Jesus for an eternal end. We're not given any excuses, right? Honor people except when you're like not in the mood, you know, or you need a Snickers or something like that. No, <laughs> all the time, right? That's not going to be good enough for Jesus. But Jesus, I didn't have any Snickers, so I went nuts on this person. You get it, right? No. <clears throat> Look at Philippians. We saw this in the Philippians series. God has generously granted you the privilege <laughs> not only of believing in Christ, but also, what? Suffering for Christ's sake. Jesus was the model. 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come among you to test you. These are not strange happenings. Instead, rejoice as you share Christ's suffering. You share his suffering now so that you may also have overwhelming joy when his glory is revealed. If you are mocked because of Christ's name, you are blessed for the spirit of glory. Indeed, the spirit of God rests on you. Peter and Paul echo Jesus' teaching. We saw this a while back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.11. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Jesus speaking, be full of joy and be glad because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harassed the prophets who came before you. Hope in the midst of suffering. In 2 Peter, he speaks of being a witness. We talked about that. I'm just going through themes. 2 Peter 1.16, we didn't repeat crafty myths when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quite the contrary. We witnessed his majesty with our own eyes. And indeed, Peter is suffering as well. Second Peter is his farewell letter, knowing that he will die. History records Peter as being crucified upside down. He was not worthy of being crucified the way the master Jesus was. Like Paul, Peter warns, warns about false teachers. A lot of that that we've been seeing, which is why he refers to Paul in that context of false teachers. He warns that Christ will return, 2 Peter 3.14. Therefore, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, Christ's return, make every effort to be found by him in peace, pure and faultless. Consider the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as our dear friend and brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of these things in all his letters. Some of his remarks are hard to understand, and people who are ignorant and whose faith is weak twist them to their own destruction, just as they do the other scriptures. That is still happening today, right? This is complicated. Maybe I'll make it really simple take a line here, a line there, and come up with some better-sounding theology. <laughs> a lot of churches will not talk about suffering or persecution, but they talked about it in the Bible. And now we're going to see how it applies. So aside from being good witnesses, which was a carryover from Titus and the reality of suffering for the faith, which was tied into Paul and Philippians, we see a redemptive theme in Peter's life. Peter wasn't perfect, and neither are we. St. Augustine said, There is no saint without a past, and no sinner without a future. This is something we must keep in mind when interacting with one another. So let's look at some examples of how Peter messes up. 
Peter gets called Satan. <laughs> the funny thing about this one is it happens right after Jesus praises him for recognizing him as the Son of God, but then this happens. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts or scribes, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus. Imagine scolding Jesus. No, no, no. Began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. I got it. <laughs> but he turned to Peter. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Imagine that. <laughs> Peter falls asleep while well, he's supposed to be keeping watch three times. Peter, James, and John. And they go up with Jesus. We talked about this when we were talking about anxiety. Jesus was deeply distressed and horrified because he knew he had to go to the cross. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass. I don't want to do this. But if it is your will, and indeed, he was obedient to the cross. So he's praying, sweating blood in the garden. That's a real thing. He comes back to Peter who's supposed to be keeping watch, right? The same guy who's like, no, 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 Lord, I won't let that happen to you. Matthew 26, 40, he came back to the disciples, Jesus, and found them sleeping. He said to Peter, couldn't you stay alert for one hour with me? Stay alert and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager or willing, but the flesh is weak. Most famously, Peter denies Jesus. Quite emphatically, Jesus is on trial. He's getting slapped around. They're about to deem him worthy of death. Matthew 26, starting at verse 69. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant woman came to him and said, You were also with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it in front of them, saying, I don't know what you are talking about. When he went over to the gate, another woman saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. With a solemn pledge, he denied it again, saying, I don't know the man. A short time later, those who were standing there came and said to Peter, You must be one of them. The way you talk gives it away. Then he cursed and swore. I won't do it. I don't know the man. At that very moment, the rooster crowed. Peter remembered Jesus' words. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. No, 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 Jesus. This won't happen to you. And denies him three times. Paul rebu rebukes Peter. Remember that sin of partiality we were talking about in James. Well, Paul recounts this in Galatians. Galatians 2.11, But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. He had been eating with the Gentiles before certain people came in from James, the Jewish people. But when they came in, he began to back out, Jewish believers, I should say, so you're not confused, and separate himself because he was afraid of the people who promoted circumcision. We talked about that. And the rest of the Jews also joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas got carried away with them in their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they weren't acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of everyone, if you, though you're a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you require the Gentiles to live like Jews? They're separating, right? They're not hanging, it's like the cool crowd. <laughs> and they decide to go hang out with the cool people and we're not going to hang out with the unpopular people anymore. Partiality. But Peter is still wholly righteous and redeemed. Most scholars believe, as I said before, <clears throat> the gospel writer Mark got his information from Peter. 1 Peter 5.13, the fellow elect church in Babylon, or Rome, greets you, and so does my son Mark. Not literally his son, but he's like a son to him. Remember, when we were in Mark, we talked about his redemption. Right? That's the argument that Paul and Barnabas, who he's talking about there, they get in that argument over Mark. Mark abandons them at a certain point. Barnabas, because he's his cousin, he's like, bro, I want to take along my cousin again. Paul's like, no way, man, he abandoned us. And so they get in a split. And then interestingly, this kind of ties together, it's kind of cool, Paul takes Silvanus, or Silas, and Barnabas 
Mark, and they separate, they go separate ways. But what did we learn? We learned that they reconcile Paul and Mark. And Mark goes on to write a whole part of the Bible. He was redeemed in a similar fashion. Mark's teacher, Peter, wasn't perfect. Yet Jesus considered him his lead disciple. And some would argue, trusted him with the church. He was still an apostle, despite his mistakes. Here's the thing. No matter how far we've strayed, no matter what we've done, there is a place for all of us in the church. There is a place for all of us as the body of Christ. But maybe you don't feel worthy. Maybe you're feeling shame and embarrassment over something, like Peter did. Let's recall his reaction. Matthew 26, 75. Peter remembered Jesus' words, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. Yet, remember, this is pre-crucifixion. Yet he goes on to be an apostle, to continue to be an apostle. Peter is still worthy of service. In fact, at a very high level, we will feel shame, remorse, embarrassment, or guilt when we do something wrong. These are natural feelings. It's okay. But we don't have to stay that way. Maybe you don't know. Like I said before, maybe it's not obvious some things that I think are obvious. So I'll say it to you. Maybe somebody needs to hear this today. Jesus came for sinners. Do you understand that? Jesus came for sinners. He says that, right? He's eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. It isn't the well, it isn't the people who are healthy that need a physician, it's the people who are sick. In Luke 15, I'm not going to read it to you because it'll take too long, we're running out of time. So I'll paraphrase it for you just so that you get the idea, but that's your homework. Read Luke 15 today or tomorrow, or sometime, anytime, just read it. In Luke 15, we see three parables, and they depict representations of God, searching for lost things. I know it sounds kind of funny. We think of ourselves as the seekers, but God seeks lost things in these parables. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of cool. So he starts in kind of like this descending order, if you want to look at it in a ratio, these three different ratios. First it's 100 to 1, then it's 10 to 1, then it's 1 to 1. Really interesting when you look at it. So Jesus gives these examples. The first one is of a shepherd. Right? So they criticize him. as a different kind of way they're criticizing than what I just paraphrased. But he's hanging out with sinners. How can you do that? So Jesus says, what one of you, if you lost a sheep, and you had a hundred of them, wouldn't go after that one sheep? leaving the 99 behind. And then when you find it, you're going to sling it over your shoulders and you're going to go to all your friends and you're going to celebrate in the same way. There's a party in heaven when just one person repents and turns back to God. Then it's the woman with the 10 coins, the drachma. Each one's worth about a day's wages. She has 10 of them. She loses one. Even though she has nine other ones, she still scours the house. He gives you this image of her just like turning the house upside down, cleaning everything to find the one coin. When she finds the coin, she gathers her friends together and they have a party. In the same way, the angels have a party in heaven when just one, just one sinner repents and turns back to God. Then there's the most famous one, the prodigal son. Everybody knows this parable, right? There's the father and he has the two sons, the older one and the younger one, of course. If there's an older one, there's a younger one, there's got to be an older one. Anyway, (coughs) The paint, or the fumes. Um, <laughs> the younger one, he wants his inheritance. It's probably a third of his, what his father owns because he's the younger son. Older one gets two-thirds, the younger one gets one-third. I don't know how I know that. Anyway, <clears throat> he gets the inheritance, and what does he do? We all know. He goes off to a strange land, and he spends it all on foolish living. He's so destitute that he makes himself a slave to someone else. 
insult to injury. The guy sends him to feed the pigs. If you're Jewish, this is not a good thing. Pigs are unclean. He is so destitute. It says a famine hits the land. He becomes so destitute that he just wants to eat the pig food, the carob pods. They're just like shells of real food <laughs> that they feed to pigs. They won't even let him eat that. He's nobody. He's nothing. He thinks, I'm going to go back to my dad because even his slaves have bread to eat. So he does. And when he does, Jesus gives us this picture of the Father. He's already searching for him. He sees him off at a distance. It implies that he's searching. And when he comes back, he's like, no, 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 not a slave. You're my son. Puts the ring on his finger, the robe on him, the sandals on his feet. Implies this guy didn't even have shoes. Then he throws a party. See the theme here? They celebrate. But the older brother... What does he do? Uh Uh-uh. He left us. He spent all his money on prostitutes. He's a sinner. You've never even sacrificed so much as a goat for me. And now you're doing all this stuff for this guy? He condemns him. But the father, no, 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 no. He was once lost. Now he's found. He was once dead. He's alive again. Let's celebrate. You may have regret about something you did in a moment, in a season. But what is Jesus teaching us here? You picking it up? These things may not be who you are. May have been something that you did in a moment. Out of fear, confusion, weakness, and a season. Out of fear, confusion, weakness. Remember Peter? He's probably afraid. Jesus is going to get crucified. They all scattered. Maybe all of them but John. I'd be afraid too. I don't want to get arrested, beaten, and crucified. But this thing, no matter why you did it, doesn't represent who you are. It doesn't mean that we don't love Jesus. Look at what Jesus does. This is at the end of John. So Jesus has resurrected, risen from the dead. Jesus does this. It's quite interesting. John 21, 15. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Now, if you didn't get this, this is okay, and I'm going to throw myself under the bus. I didn't get this the first time I read it. But there is a redemptive theme here in the way Jesus asks Peter three times. He turns it upside down from his three denials. Maybe you have some of these moments in your life that haunt you. Maybe there are three of them. (laughs) There are four of them. Maybe there are five of them. Maybe there's just one of them. And the enemy like the older brother in the parable, is going to be real quick to remind you of that sin. All the time, every chance he gets. You're the son that left us. You're the daughter that left us. You're the one that went with the prostitutes. You're the liar. You're the thief. You're the drug addict. You're the alcoholic. That's what the enemy does. It's his job. But I'm here to tell you, on behalf of the Lord, I hope, (laughs) there are 40 things over here that prove you are capable of being a credible witness, a great servant of the Lord. You are holy, righteous, and redeemed. Did you hear me? Don't forget that. 
the Christians that Paul and Peter are calling us to be are so that we can be good witnesses for the gospel. That's what this is all about. It's about Jesus. But the enemy doesn't want that. He hates that. Oh, I don't want the angels celebrating in heaven. It's not allowed there anymore. So don't listen to those who are evil. 1 John 4, 4, you're going to recognize this from the song lyrics. You are from God, little children. You are from God. And you have defeated these people because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. So they speak from the world's point of view. And the world listens to them. We are from God. The person who knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God doesn't listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Truth and reality are in Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit by which all good things are done. So don't live your life looking in the rear mirror or you're going to crash. Doesn't help. Philippians 3.13, Brothers and sisters, Paul writes, I myself don't think I've reached it, but I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. It's about forward thinking. So as we move forward, we do want to avoid future mistakes, of course. Remember, what I said in the past, that we want to be getting better as we move forward, naturally. So practically, if we're using driving analogies, the rear of your mirror, don't stare at that while you're trying to go forward. Also, don't go really, really fast everywhere. <laughs> Drive with caution. James, we looked at James last week. He also says to be slow to speak. James 1.19. Know this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to grow angry. This is because an angry person doesn't produce God's righteousness. You're not going to be a good witness like that. Therefore, with humility, set aside all moral filth and the growth of wickedness and become the word planted deep inside you, the very word that is able to save you. You're hearing the word now. Nourish yourself by the word of God. If you're not reading your Bible, do it. It helps. Remember, we saw that in Timothy. And pray before you speak. So this week, let's keep in mind, we are all capable of being worthy witnesses for Jesus. That is the whole point. We are vehicles of his love and his grace for the sake of the gospel. No matter what we've done wrong in the past. Let's focus on the future, the upward call of Christ. So let's end with this passage. 2 Peter 3.17 Therefore, dear friends, since you have been warned in advance, be on guard so that you aren't led off course into the error of sinful people and lose your own safe position. Instead, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory now and forever. Amen. Love you guys. <laughs>